Eight three one six five two seven one two zero one nine zero nine one four five six four eight five six six nine two three four six zero three four eight six one zero four five four three two six six four eight two one three three nine three six zero seven two six zero two four nine one four one two seven three. Set are the building blocks of the integers. You can think of them as math's periodic table, since every integer is a product of these prime numbers. Okay, so these are show up all over number theory, tons and tons of open questions, things we still don't know about primes. One thing we do know is that there are infinitely many primes. So this was first proven a couple thousand years ago by Euclid, and we're going to go over his proof. Okay, so this is a proof by contradiction. We're gonna assume that there's only finitely many primes and you can just list them out. So P1, P2, all the way up to PT, where T is some finite number, we don't know how big it is. So we wanna proceed through a series of logical deductions and we're gonna get something impossible. And when we get something impossible, that means our original conclusion must have been wrong. Okay, so. Here's the big idea of the proof. So we're gonna let 
capital N be this number. You multiply all the primes together and you add one. Okay? So now we know that every positive integer, n has to be positive, right? We're taking a bunch of primes which are all positive, multiply them together, you add one, it's still positive, it's bigger than one. So it has to have a prime divisor. I won't prove that for you, but it's not too hard to prove. So let's let q be the name of that prime divisor. Okay, well if q is a prime divisor of n, it divides n, just by definition of prime divisor. And if it's a prime, it has to be one of the primes on our list, because we're assuming those are the only ones we have. So we have q dividing n, and then we have q dividing that whole product. I'll say that again. Q has to divide that whole product, since it's one of those p's on the list. But if q divides two different numbers, it has to divide their difference as well. I'll let you think about why. You could factor it out of the difference. But their difference is just one. So Q is a prime divisor of N. It's one of the PIs. That means it must divide one, but no primes divide one, right? That's just silly. So there's our contradiction. So if we assume that there's only finitely many primes, we get something impossible out. So the only place we could have gone wrong is our original assumption that there were only finitely many primes. So by contradiction, we've just proved there are infinitely many. Make sense? Okay, so famous, famous proof. Due to Euclid. No need to clap. <laughs> okay, here's another proof of the same fact. This one's going to take a little longer, but it's going to be interesting. Okay, so this one is due to Goldbach from 1730. To prove this one, I need to tell you what a Fermat number is. So how many people know Fermat's last theorem? Okay, if you don't, you should go home and watch the proof. It's a Nova special. It's great. I've seen it literally at least like 20, 30 times. Really, really good. Uh, and I won't tell you the whole story. I, I'll refrain from telling you the story. But this, this Fermat number, Fermat, again, same Fermat I've talked about. And a Fermat number is 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1. So we have a sequence infinitely long of Fermat numbers, where you plug in 0, you plug in 1, you plug in 2, you keep going. So 3, 5, 17, 257, and so on. It turns out the first five of those are primes, and they're the only primes we know in the list. We don't know if there's more in there that are prime or not. Okay, we're going to use these Fermat numbers to come up with another proof that there are infinitely many prime numbers. So here's what we're going to do. First thing I want to do is claim that if you multiply the first n Fermat numbers together and you add 2, you get the next Fermat number on the list. So let's just check that that works for the few examples I gave you. So if you take 3 times 5, you multiply them together, you add 2, you get 17. That was the next one on the list, if you remember. If you take 3 times 5 times 17, that's 15 times 17, which is 220, no, 255, uh, plus 2 gives us 257, which is the next one on the list. And you can keep going if you want to, and it'll appear to work. So we want to prove this in general, that this property always holds. Okay, we're going to do a proof by induction, which I'm guessing is new to a lot of you. Has anybody seen proof by induction before? Okay, a few of you. So here's the idea. Okay, the base case. Well, first let me tell you the idea. So proof by induction is a technique that you use when you want to prove something is true for all integers greater than or equal to some starting point. So I want you to imagine an infinite ladder and each rung on the ladder corresponds to an integer. So if, the, if for our case we want to prove this for all n greater than or equal to 0, you're going to imagine that bottom rung is 0, and then the next rung is 1, 2, 3, etc. So we have to prove this statement for all the rungs on the ladder. So with induction we do it in two steps. The first step is called the base case, and that means just checking that it's true for this first rung on the ladder. So we did that already on the previous slide. We check it for the first two rungs, actually. 
The second part of induction lets us move from one rung of the ladder to the next. So we're going to say that suppose we know the statement is true for some specific integer, any one, it has to then be true for the very next one. So that's an if-then statement. We're proving that if it's true for one rung, it's true for the very next rung. So if we can prove that, that lets us go from one rung to the next. So with the base case, we get on the ladder. And then the next step lets us go from one rung to the next. If it's true for the first one, it's true for the second one. Do it again. If it's true for the second one, it's true for the third one. Do it again. If it's true for the second one, it's true for the third one. And we keep going all the way up, and we prove it for all infinitely many. OK, so that's the plan. Plan makes sense? How is this useful to us? Remember, our goal is to come up with another proof that there are infinitely many prime numbers. So we're going to use this sequence of fair amount numbers. OK, so that's what we proved. OK, so the first thing we're going to do is notice that these fair amount numbers are pairwise relatively prime. OK, so what does that mean? Relatively prime just means that there's no primes in common. So they don't have to be prime numbers, say 6 and 7. Those numbers are relatively prime. They're not both prime, but they don't have any primes in common with each other. Pairwise just means you look at the whole list. No two have any primes in common with each other. OK, so to prove that, we're going to do another proof by contradiction. This is a very useful strategy in math. Suppose you had some prime number, call it p, that divided two different Fermat numbers. And we're going to show that that doesn't work. So suppose that p divides fm and p divides fn. So they're different Fermat numbers, so one of them has to be bigger than the other. So let's just call n the bigger one. It doesn't matter which name we give it, right? It's just a name. OK, well then, look at our formula that we just proved, that the product f0 to fn minus 1 plus 2 is equal to fn. So fn is on the left, and that's divisible by p. But f sub m, I claim, is also on the list. It's one of these numbers in here, right? Since m is less than n. Since m is less than n, fm is one of those in the product. So this looks a little familiar. So p divides both of those. So it has to divide their difference. So their difference is 2. So this, we just showed that if you have any p dividing two different Fermat numbers, then p must divide 2. Well, the only prime that divides 2 is what? 2, two right? So we've shown so far that the only prime that could possibly divide more than one Fermat number is 2. But does 2 divide any of the Fermat numbers? No. No. How'd you know? Power of 2 plus 1. Yeah, so the, the Fermat numbers, oh, the definition's not up there, but they're a power of 2 plus 1, right? So they're all odd. So this says that if you have a P dividing two different Fermat numbers, it has to be 2, but 2 doesn't divide any Fermat numbers, okay? So the result is that there can't be any primes that divide more than one Fermat number. But there's infinitely many Fermat numbers, right? As you keep plugging in your successive ends, the numbers get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So there's infinitely many of them. They're all positive integers, so they're all divisible by some primes. But the primes don't overlap at all. So this shows there must be infinitely many primes as well. So same idea as Euclid, right? Well, let's suppose for contradiction that there's only finitely many primes that are congruent to 3 mod 4. So that's all of them. There's other primes out there that are 1 mod 4, but these are all my primes that are 3 mod 4. I'm going to do my fancy expression for n. To multiply those all together, multiply by 4 and subtract 1. If I started three years ago at Williams College, I'm the director. Uh, this is a one week roughly, we're going up to 10 days this year for the first time, math camp. It's free for participants, you just have to get there. We don't pay for you to get there and to get back home, but room and board is free, attendance is free. We do number theory and prove things, and you get to meet undergrads that are doing original research and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, this is for high school students in general, but I have had a couple people that were just finishing eighth grade and going into high school next year. 
So I just want to put this on your radar. If you're in eighth grade now, you can apply. If not, apply in future years. It's at Williams and it's lots of fun. Okay, thank you very much.